Gender identity disorder was first introduced into the DSM version 3 in 1980, seven years after the gay community celebrated the removal of homosexuality from the manual. Few took notice at first, but almost immediately, many were being treated for GID. I have a copy of a handwritten note from my doctor, you know, stating that I had gender identity disorder present since grade three. We had one 15 minute meeting and that was my primary diagnosis. And this coincidentally is just as gender identity disorder is invented and the first edition without homosexuality. When Daphne Shalinsky was 15 years old, she suffered severe depression due to multiple issues. When her parents went to a therapist for advice, they were told they had one option, to lock her in a psychiatric facility. But rather than being treated for depression, gender became the immediate focus of the doctors. It was like this barrage of just constantly, you know, like dripping water on my forehead over and over and over again. You're wrong, you're bad, you're ugly, and you're crazy. Daphne, now Dylan, would spend three years locked up and treated for gender identity disorder. As more stories like Dylan's got out, with the help of books like Gender Shock and Dylan's own, The Last Time I Wore a Dress, the LGBT community began organizing and demanding the removal of the diagnosis from the DSM. But that unified demand was cut short when the diagnosis was revised in the 1994 release of the DSM-4, suddenly pitting the interests of gender-variant children against access to health care for adults. When they combined GID in children and transsexualism into one diagnosis, it created a major rift within our community after having gained so much momentum in movement towards change. It took our focus off of the psychiatric system and onto each other. Children and adults are quite different because although the diagnosis in adults presumes a good degree of stability that that person who has gender dysphoria will remain gender dysphoric for a long time, with children that's not necessarily the case. So it's very difficult to lump all of them together. While many recognize how the diagnosis can be damaging to children, Many adults require the GID diagnosis to attain access to certain health care. Outright removal, some are concerned, could threaten this access. A lot of transgender people need transgender-specific care. In order to be allowed to access that care and to have that care paid for by private or public insurance plans, it's necessary for there to be a diagnosis on which to base the treatment we must have some sort of medical diagnosis, and there's just no question about that. It would be devastating, it would be a disaster. The trouble for many is that GID is classified as a psychiatric illness, which for many, like Dr. Christine McGinn, who works primarily with transgender patients, still carries the potential for stigma or discrimination. It is a double-edged sword because, um, you know, myself, as a personal story, every time I apply for privileges at a hospital, I have to fill out an application and they specifically ask me if I have any psychiatric diagnosis. So, although I had to go through the therapy process to get my surgery, I don't feel as if I have a psychiatric illness and I'm quite functional. <laughs> it saddens me every time, frankly, that I have to fill that out. The way that the diagnosis as it stands now is harmful is that it actually is saying that their gender identity is disordered when in fact what's disordered is their brain identity and phenotypically how they present or their body is incongruent. The primary concern about the GID diagnosis is that it pathologizes from a mental health perspective a medical condition. If something can be fixed with a physical transformation, then it shouldn't be categorized as a mental health condition. The challenge then for the revision process for the DSM-5 working group is how to potentially reform GID and address concerns over treatment of children, stigmatizing language, and adult access to health care. I think that the APA is working with the disease concept, right? They're medical folks, they're psychiatric folks, and we don't think gender identity is a disorder. So we'd like to see it removed from the DSM, but only with the assurance that trans people and gender non-conforming people can get the services that they need. Without a doubt, we're in a dilemma because we, on the one hand, need the diagnosis. On the other hand, the diagnosis uh, 
facilitates abuse, mistreatment, and misperceptions of transgender people.